Okay. Uh, yesterday, I actually gave a demo where I was very happy to see uh, 1,008 cores all say hello world. So um, today is uh, is more of just a talk and an explanation of uh, uh, basically using H uh, AWS for HPC. Okay, let's see if I can get this right. Okay. Um, so we like to say it's about uh, science, not about servers. Our ultimate goal is to basically allow researchers to extend into the cloud without having to have much IT experience. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Oh well, I'm a little bit ahead of myself. Um, so uh, the, we're not there yet. But we're getting there, particularly with partners. Um, I encourage you to go look at Ronin uh, out in the um, uh, exhibition hall in the Intel booth. They're one of our partners who is doing an excellent job of trying to make it more transparent for researchers to get onto the cloud and uh, handle some of the uh, scary things like budgets. Um, some of the great features that we have in uh, HPC uh, at AWS are the ability to experiment without fear. It's almost a company motto uh, to fail fast. You know, the objective is not to spend a year doing some research and setting up your servers and uh, spending an enormous amount of time in simulation only to discover that you made a fundamental uh, error in insight at the beginning. It's nice to know that quickly. I've done that before. Uh, um, in my background, I spent uh, 25 years as an aerospace professor, and I've had my own embarrassments where I spent a year doing research only to figure out that one of my initial assumptions was incorrect. Um, uh, some of the things that we allow are uh, the ability to start and stop instances, which is critical for cost. Um, in fact, that's probably the way people save money the most, is to be able to, when you're not working, to stop an instance, or uh, in your language, maybe a node uh, would be the right term, um, to stop it, and you're only charged for what you use, so when you stop it, you're not paying for it. We also have spot pricing. Spot pricing is really good for researchers, because we're not, we're not banks where we have to deal with transactions, immediate transactions. We're not Netflix where you don't want to have customers have to wait and, uh, for their streaming. We research typically, you know, we can wait a little while if the, if the resources aren't available. We're used to queues. Um, notice my shirt says, uh, oops, notice my shirt says there's no queue in the cloud. Uh, but with Spot, you can actually accept a queue. So what is Spot? Spot is our excess capacity. It means that if there is excess capacity, we can uh, we charge you between 90 to 70 percent less than on-demand prices. So it's a really good way to save money, and researchers tend to, to use that. Uh, by using cloud, you don't have to worry about the infrastructure that updates. The you always get what's best. So I'm, later on, I'm going to show benchmarks against the uh, uh, Archer, which is the UK Cray. Uh, for, that's supplied for research. The problem with that is that it's now getting kind of old. It uses Ivy Bridge technology. It's about five years old. Um, and, you know, using Skylake technology, we're, we're twice as fast. So you get the benefit of continual updates. You know, you can pretty much guess that if something is new on the horizon, AWS is going to be one of the first to have it. So. By being part of AWS, you can get the best uh, the quickest. Uh, network, storage, all the services, continually updating. You don't have to worry about updating the operating system. Uh, some of the ways that people use uh, AWS is to run many jobs in parallel. Uh, TLG Aerospace, as an example, will run instead of uh, one job in serial and take a week to do a customer's workload, they run them all in parallel and get them done overnight. That allows them to do their engineering work and their analysis over the week. It doesn't cost any more to run them in parallel as it does serial because you pay for what you use. Um, the, uh, if you run on demand, you have no queue. Typically, in 95% of the cases, if you run spot, you're also going to get immediate uh, um, immediate satisfaction. You'll you'll run right out of the box. Um, you can you don't have to worry about pre-provisioning. There's no ordering of, of parts and saying I need a cluster of so many cores, waiting six months for it to get uh, to get delivered and installed. Um, we can set up a cluster uh, this afternoon and run. 
Um, I did, I uh, launched a, a true HPC cluster with 1,008 uh, Skylake cores. Uh, did that yesterday, the entire demo was a half an hour. Uh, the cost advantage is really is that you're only paying for what you use and you don't have to over provision uh, guessing what the workload's gonna be. Each cluster can be actually launched per job if you want to. Uh, in fact, some people actually do that for particularly for highly coupled uh, schemes, uh, highly coupled codes that take uh, um, hours or even days to run. Uh, with AWS and the pay-as-you-go pricing and the scaling, the auto-scaling, uh, that's really where you save the money, is not paying for what you're not using. Um, a lot of people look at what, what would it cost to run my on-prem facility on AWS? If you do that uh, without looking at all the benefits of cloud, you're actually going to pay more on AWS. The benefit is the scaling, the ability to shrink and expand and only pay for what you use. And uh, I mean, how many of you uh, are in situations where your cluster is perfectly sized, it's 100% utilized, no queue? Um, no, that doesn't exist. I've never seen that. Um, I got started in AWS in 2014 when I was in a consulting company with two people. Because we had access to AWS, because we were using AWS, uh, we were able to bid on jobs that NASA and Boeing would bid on. We didn't have any infrastructure. All we did is we, did, we were able to bid on the job using AWS and they just passed the cost on to, to the, and actually it was cheaper than NASA or uh, Boeing could do because, well, NASA's government, so different cost structure, but um, we could actually bid on, a, on large jobs and do it cheaper because we weren't, we weren't having to support infrastructure. A lot of popular workloads, um, genomics, uh, modeling and simulation. I come from a background of computational fluid dynamics. And what I'm gonna show later is some CFD uh, simulations, or it's not simulations, but results, timing results. Monte Carlo, uh, embarrassingly parallel kind of schemes are, are, uh, are very easy to run on AWS. I had a colleague who ran a, um, a uh, financial simulation for a uh, proof of concept for a bank in London and ran 1.3 million cores and that was in our excess capacity. So the amount of resources is sort of astronomical. Uh, some of the important enablers is we have a variety of choices for node types. For example, we can, uh, you can choose how much memory you want per core. Our, our classic compute would be four gigabytes per core but we also have high memory instances if you need, uh, if you have applications that require more memory. It's 16 gigabits per core. We have some, uh, some, uh, 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 some nodes, some instances that go up to 12 and a half terabytes per core. Uh, so there's a lot of options. Uh, we have GPUs. We have, for those that are really uh, adventurous, FPGAs. Uh, those are uh, pr field programmable gate arrays. I've seen some very interesting simulations. While they look very expensive when you look at the price, because you can tailor it for your problem, they end up being cheaper than using a classic um, Skylake or whatever Intel chip. Uh, we have choices between uh, Intel, AMD, ARM type processors. So depending on your workload and what, uh, what you want, uh, how efficient you want it, you have, you have lots of choices. Um, we have uh, some new networking uh, capabilities. So you can actually tailor your, your uh, workload uh, depending on, or you can tailor your, uh, your cluster or your, uh, your uh, compute to have the right kind of network performance you want. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, storage, we have many, many different storage options. Uh, our new FSX for Luster, oh darn it. I'm a little bit too heavy-handed here, and there appears to be no way to go back. Okay, a little bit, uh, um, or FSX for Luster uh, is a really, uh, uh, is, is a new Luster-type file system that's shared very high performance and is backed up on our S3 uh, service. So it's really slick because it scales dynamically and then it's backed up on S3. <coughs> um, we have, um, now I've lost, since I've lost the previous slide, 
Uh, I think that's pretty much what I wanted to cover on the previous slide, but we'll get to it uh, again later. The model to look at, on the left we have a classic on-prem facility where you're trying to pack all your workloads into a given size. You have so many cores, you have so much time, and everyone's got to wait in a queue. Uh, whereas, because of our resources, um, I like to say we're to the user, we're virtually infinite. Well, we're not. I'll, I'll give some stories about where we are not quite infinite in a little while, but um, the, the reality is that for most users, you can burst in and use as much uh, resources as you want uh, at any time, and you can run your job when you want to run it. So which architecture do you, do you choose? One size does not fit all. Um, but we give you the ability to design a computer. If you're an IT person, uh, a lot of IT people are scared of the cloud because they're afraid they're going to lose their jobs. No, actually it's going to increase uh, the, the need for IT uh, resources because instead of your job being getting up at 2 in the morning to find out why your server crashed and look at your script and try to debug your script, that is actually what AWS does. Um, you don't have to do that heavy lifting. Your job will be to sit down with your researchers on a daily basis and say, what's the best architecture? You get to design a computer uh, continually and optimize. It's, it's a, a lot, I think it, it'll be a lot more fun. Uh, the type of uh, architecture is going to depend on the, uh, the experience of the user, the desired uh, uh, deployment method, characteristics of the application, my background being computation of fluids. I'm uh, very interested in seeing how different algorithms will tie into different architectures and uh, I would like to eventually see an optimum uh, way to, uh, to balance the architecture versus the, uh, the uh, application. We have a new product. Uh, this is not the only way to launch a cluster, but we have AWS Parallel Cluster, which makes it much easier. The demo I ran yesterday, I uh, showed the script that we used, um, and it, we're able to launch 1,008 Skylake cores. What's really kind of neat about it is that it dynamically allocates the compute nodes as needed. So until you submit your job, you don't have compute nodes, which means you're not paying for them. You submit your job, you say you need a, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 4,000, whatever, it starts launching those compute nodes and then uh, runs your job, and when it's done, those compute nodes go away. Uh, there are other products that launch clusters. I mentioned Ronin earlier. They now incorporate the ability to launch clusters within Ronin. Uh, the ideal, would, I think, for researchers would be just a click, click, click web page. Um, we're not there yet, but we have uh, partners that are working on that. There's many different ways to launch a cluster. Um, Parallel Cluster is, is our choice. It's built on AWS CloudFormation. The thing that's really neat about this to me is that with a 30-page configuration file, I can change how many nodes I want, I can change the type of node, I can change the, the storage uh, um, choice from, let's say, a shared uh, file system on using NFS on the head node to a, a shared file system using Lustre. I have so many choices that I can do interactively. I can change my network speed. I can do all this with, I, I said interactively, I'm sorry, in, in the config file. Just one line of code and I can change my architecture significantly. And it's very easy to do when I can launch it and five minutes later, check it out, doesn't, not what I wanted, kill it, uh, launch another one. Uh, in terms of uh, computation, what I'm talking about today is mostly cluster HPC or tightly coupled schemes. This is where a particular code uh, requires communication with all the processors that are involved. Uh, that's as opposed to grid HPC or loosely coupled, embarrassingly parallel codes like Monte Carlo schemes where each thread is totally independent of the other. There is no need for communication. Um, we can also run grid, grids of clusters. So, for example, I mentioned TLG Aerospace that, that used to run a single simulation, and it took about a week to get through their workload. Instead, they launch multiple clusters, and they can actually run them simultaneously, get the job done overnight, and instead of waiting a week, basically overnight they have all their results. Um, grid computing examples. Uh, uh, Large Hadron uh, Collider in CERN uses us to do some data analysis. Um, that plot in the lower left, uh, or in the mid-left, sorry, mid-right, I'm 
backwards here, mid-right, shows their workload. You can actually see a weekend when everyone was off. <laughs> um, but that's their workload over time. If you were going to buy a facility for that, that's a little bit hard. What do you choose? If you uh, pick the plateau, let me see if I can do this. If you pick the, pick the plateau here to size your machine, well, you're going to have a huge queue later on when the workload comes in. If you pick something up here to cover the maximum, you're going to uh, have a lot of excess capacity that's wasted and a lot of cost in that. So how do you uh, choose that? Well, um, this lower plot shows us the white line here is the total uh, CPU uh, used. AWS, by using auto scaling, follows exactly the workload. You're only paying for what's being used. So it's a very, very uh, cost effective means uh, for a, a project like the um, Large Hadron Collider. Uh, Clemson University used 1.1 million vCPUs. I, let me quickly define a vCPU because this always confuses researchers. If you look at your uh, Intel uh, chips, uh, our Intel selections, everything is uh, listed by vCPUs. And a, oh geez, it takes nothing. Um, I should put this down in between. Right. <laughs> um, the vCPUs uh, are uh, threads. Intel is, has so, such high parallelism within each CPU that they allow two threads to run through each uh, CPU. When you're doing high performance computing, typically you're using the math coprocessor quite a bit. And so you're using the same registers, the same parts of the chip, so it doesn't really help to hyperthread. So we usually turn off hyperthreading. This is on automatic now. Um, I'm, in, I'm a little bit in trouble. Maybe it's telling me I need to hurry. Uh, um, uh, anyways, uh, 1.3 million vCPUs for natural language. Uh, tightly coupled schemes, this is the cluster computing. Uh, the line up the middle there that's kind of faint, that's ideal scaling. That's if everything was par perfectly parallel. Well, you have a lot of things within the code. You have network latency. You have um, uh, you have memory latency. Actually, most codes are uh, memory to uh, memory latency, not uh, not network latency. Network latency is always blamed, though. Um, this is uh, for WARF, which is a weather code, and that uh, blue, that darker blue line shows the uh, the scaling relative to the ideal performance. Uh, computational fluids. This is ANSYS, similar plot. Um, Okay. <laughs> um, the uh, computational fluid dynamics is actually code that scales extremely well because it is mostly memory bound. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Uh, it is mostly memory bound. The dash green line there, by the way, again, is ideal scaling. We get a fair amount of speed up. You'll notice this is the number of cores. We're down to uh, 2016 cores, 2016 cores in this case. Um, and it's still scaling quite well. Okay. This is the kind of plot you would see if you were running on a Cray or a Fujitsu or something. The turning point where you start to get uh, an excess is actually um, a little bit, uh, uh, or that's where you're going to see differences in different architectures. And I will talk a little about the network if I have time, because that's always a question people have. Uh, we've had a lot of innovations lately. I would have to say if I were to simplify uh, or give a simple description of how HPC evolved on AWS, I would almost have to say that researchers found AWS first. And then AWS is now starting to uh, look at research as being a very important part of our product line. And so in the last year we've launched, as I mentioned, uh, a parallel cluster is, is our cluster management, fully managed uh, HPC cluster tool. Uh, we also have our high performance shared file system, FSX for Lustre, which I mentioned. We have a uh, high clock speed compute instance, the Z1D, which is sustained 4 gigahertz. Um, we have uh, our network instance, uh, high bandwidth instance, C5N, which has 100 gigabit per second uh, networking capability, and this is per node. Okay. Our network is very different than most. It's not a backbone. It's not a, um, what you get with InfiniBand. Instead, it's a point-to-point. -point. We have our high-performance interconnect, EFA, Elastic uh, Fabric Adapter, which has halved our uh, latency. 
Uh, we have, again, a parallel cluster. We also have a multi-node parallel job support for AWS Batch, so people doing genomics can actually do a scheduler, uh, scheduled process where you'd have different uh, compute nodes doing different tasks in, in a schedule, um, basically supporting, uh, supporting uh, 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 containers. Okay. Here's an example of what EFA does. This is a CFD uh, code, um, uh, Metacomp, CFD++, on a 24 million uh, core. This was actually done for fun. I don't think the Klingon battle cruiser will ever fly in the atmosphere, but it is kind of a cool uh, little, little plot. The, the, uh, again, the red line is ideal scaling. The purple line is pre-EFA, uh, pre-elastic fabric adapter, and this is where you get to about 500 cores and your network gets saturated due to inter-processor communication. Uh, with EFA, we continue up well past 1,000 cores without that network uh, saturation. So this is a case where the network actually is the limiting factor, and we've, uh, we're doing quite well. I will say that we're running lots of benchmarks now against Craze and similar machines and actually doing quite well, uh, competing very favorably with some of the supercomputers. So let's look at some, do some scaling benchmarks. So uh, we ran Archer, which is, as I mentioned, a little bit of a dated machine, so we expect to do better. Um, and AWS, we uh, use the Z1D, which is our four gigahertz, um, 24 processors per instance, and then we ran a C5N, which is our, uh, our 100 gigabit per second. This, it turns out, did not use EFA. I have this in here, but I found out from my colleague that they did not use EFA for this. So this is actually not our fast, Late or low latency, but it is our high network bandwidth. Um, we used OpenFOAM. Now, OpenFOAM, if you're familiar, is actually a suite of CFD tools. We use the PimpleFOAM, which is this, uh, the um, most common for aerodynamic calculations. Uh, when you do calculations, you need to play around with the process in the calculation. It's not just a simple turn the switch and go because each architecture is going to have a little bit better performance with different method, methodologies within the code. Um, this is all kind of, you know, if you know CFD, it might mean something. <laughs> um, when you run, you have to consider a lot of different things. When we deal with customers to do benchmarks, we say, give us your big code. It's very common that people give a little small test problem, and they say, how does that scale? No, that, that really isn't, you know, you're not going to run your test problem. Give us your big regular application. Biggest, give us your biggest application. We'll test that because that's what you want to be able to do. And, uh, and so benchmarking should be on, on the large examples. Um, you need to, normally the optimization for tightly coupled schemes or tightly coupled algorithms like you have in CFD, for example, is how many cells, compute cells you need per core. And so you're going to play some games and optimizing that. Uh, sometimes you're better off actually shutting off some processors on a node because you get cache conflicts. And uh, the cache uh, speed actually slows things down. So optimizing, you know, if you have a 36 uh, core, uh, in, uh, core instance, sometimes it's better to run 32 cores and let four sit idle because you're actually going to get a faster solution. Lots of games to play in optimization. Um, Networking, we have a placement group because one, uh, one of the people or one of the things people are concerned about is the distance between nodes. If you have a node that's on the other side of the, the data center, that's not going to be helped because the, the uh, latency between that's going to be large. So we specify placement groups that put all the, the cores or the, all the nodes in a, in a, a certain <coughs> near region. Checking MPI libraries, these are all sort of optimization tools. Um, quickly, if you've used Amdahl's law, Amdahl basically specifies what the scaling is based on the number of cores. The, or the ideal is, of course, that you double the number of cores, you double the performance, you quadruple, quadruple, and so on. Those are the diagonal lines that I showed in those earlier plots. However, uh, Gustafsson uh, said, well, that's not how we run typical uh, codes. We don't take a code and we, and, uh, or a, a workload and then double the number of cores. Typically what happens is when we take a workload and we double the number of cores, we also double the size of the problem because we're going to increase our workload as we get more and more compute. 
and uh, the size of our problem. So Gufsoft's scaling is a little bit better, a little bit more realistic, follows the actual workloads that we have. So what I'm going to show is kind of Gustafsson's, um, follows Gustafsson's law, not Amdahl's. So these are results from a, a uh, fairly significant uh, customer, and I can't, I can't uh, tell you who the customer is yet. We're really close, and it's an exciting one, I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, on the left uh, vertical axis, the seconds per time step, which means that down is better. That's less time, okay, to compute. Um, you know, it's always nice to have up be good, but in this case, down is good. On the uh, lower axis is cells per core, so as we go to the left, we're running more and more uh, cores. To the right is fewer and fewer. Uh, these are two simulations we ran, a fine and a medium mesh. The fine mesh is uh, uh, 280 million cells. If you do CFD, you know that's pretty, pretty fine. I mean, that's, that's pretty high, a quarter of a billion. Uh, cells in our CFD mesh. The course was 140 million. Uh, we actually ran 400 million cells. I don't have that on here because we did a slightly different architecture and it'd be comparing apples to oranges in that case, and so I, I left those off. But 200, 280 million cell calculations on open foam. Uh, on the left, uh, down here, we have uh, our 2,000 core simulations. And one of the things you can see is Archer, which is blue, is the high, pretty much the highest on all of these. Um, in other words, Archer is slower. Of course, we expected that because it's an older machine. But we see the Z1D uh, is you know, twice as, over twice as fast, out to uh, roughly 1,000 cores, and still competes favorably about 30 to 40% faster, even out to 2,000 cores than Archer. One of the things that this uh, tells you is that the network is really not the limiting factor on OpenFoam. Uh, in fact, OpenFoam, the way it's written, does a lot of file rights, and the file rights are the limiting act, uh, factor. But we have, with our FSX for Luster, and the fact you can have local disks really helps uh, with OpenFoam. Latency, uh, it, it's really a measure of latency, and everyone blames the, the, uh, the network interconnect. And as I uh, try to explain, it's not, it's actually rarely the, the uh, latency, uh, the, or sorry, the internet, uh, in, the network interconnect. It's usually the um, memory. That's the most common uh, cause of latency. But you also non-parallel code. That's actually the worst. A lot of researchers will come in and say, hey, you know, I just ran on a 16 processor and it didn't run any faster. Do you have any parallel code? No. Okay, well, um, you know, it's, you have to have a, 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 a good parallel code. Um, there are codes that do not really run as well on AWS. Uh, we found that the codes that do quantum mechanics, like uh, quantum espresso, uh, do not uh, scale terrifically well. Beyond about four to six nodes, you're going to start losing performance. CFD runs extremely well. Weather codes run extremely well. Uh, so a lot of things will scale well to you know, 2,000, 4,000 cores and so on. Uh, OK. I want to uh, acknowledge Dr. Neil Ashton of Oxford University actually did the open foam calculations for us uh, with his access to Archer. Uh, Stephen Sachs at AWS did the 400 million cell cases, um, you know, which I did not show because it would be a little bit of apples to oranges. Um, I, oh, I, I do want to close out one thing. I did mention that we like to think of ourselves as an infinite resource. We actually became so popular that our Z1Ds and our C5Ns, actually, and our P3 GPU uh, nodes, uh, as soon as they hit the, the market, they got saturated. Um, we, of course, are fulfilling those needs rapidly, and so now you can, uh, now it's not, not as big an issue. I do want to mention that because uh, I f did feel like I was a little bit of a liar earlier when I said, uh, oh, you can just go on to C5Ns and grab as many as you want, and then people started getting hosed. But we, uh, we've corrected that issue. We just weren't expecting that much interest in them, and so we, uh, you know, we're expanding uh, rapidly, uh, the interest has really taken off. This uh, researcher's handbook gives you some basic guidelines on how to, uh, 
how to get started on AWS from a researcher's perspective. I will say that although it's two years old at AWS, that means it's rather dated, doesn't have things like parallel cluster in it, doesn't have FSx for luster, doesn't have our C5n, Z1d. Um, so it's a little bit behind, but it's a good, you can download it to get an idea and get started. Um, and uh, on the next slide, I'll uh, have a little bigger URL, so if you want to grab that. So you can download that for free. Okay, so I've left uh, uh, 16 seconds for questions. <laughs> that was on purpose, actually. Um, <laughs> um, I'd like to thank you for, for your time, and, and I'll be around if you have any questions. I can give you my business card. I'm based in London, uh, but you know, ignore the time difference, um, and I, I'll get back to you if you have questions. Okay, thank you.